Amen, amen. You can take your seats. Thank you, worship band. Today is an exciting, riveting, action-packed day in chapel. We have a special guest in the house tonight. This person is a two-time Grammy award-winning hip-hop artist. Their albums, their mixtapes have sold over 1.9 million copies. Topping the chart with the song Anomaly in 2014, our guest speaker, Lecrae. Lecrae, let's hear for Lecrae. There it is, there it is. Our guest speaker, Lecrae, topped the hot Billboard Top 200 songs with a number one song in 2014. He's been nominated for five Grammys. He's also an incredible world-class speaker. So we have a man who is a world-class artist and speaker, and it also happens that he loves Jesus. And he has spent his entire life through his, through his music and through his speaking and through his travel, not only emulating the message of Jesus, but also the method of Jesus, which funnels hope and life and light into really dark spaces. And so I think we have an awesome opportunity, if you're willing, to press in and to listen to a man who's experienced a lot, who has given up his time. He has a family, a wife, and three children, God bless him, in Atlanta, and he came here today in order to share with us. So we have an, a tremendous privilege to hear from him today. So I, I would encourage you to join me in welcoming, and also your attention, to welcoming Mr. Lecrae. How we doing? How we doing? Man, I'm like, man, they said we were out of school. School's supposed to be fun, isn't it? Oh, my fault. Well, we're going to have some fun today. Is that okay? Awesome, man. It's good to be here. Um, I'm excited. You know, God is, uh, you know, just taking me so many amazing places and uh, giving me so many unique opportunities. So I'm glad to be here with y'all today. Florida, make some noise. Anybody not from Florida? Anybody? Okay, right on. Okay, we got some visitors here today too. Me neither, so we, we're in this together. Um, man, so let me see here. Who do we have? We got, uh, what, seventh graders? Is seventh graders in the house tonight? Okay. Eighth grade, in, eighth grade in the building? Eighth grade. Ninth grade in the building, ninth grade. Really. Small clap, they're a little more mature, they clap, they were like, oh, ninth grade. Uh, 10th grade, where 10th grade is at? 10th grade. 11th, 11th grade. Where the singers at, though? Awesome, man. Congratulations, y'all got a, a, a long road ahead of you. Man, I remember, I remember my senior year. I remember senior year, I remember uh, graduating high school, and senior summer, it was time to get a job. And I got a job. I worked at the grocery store, and I had a friend and he could not find a job, y'all. He was struggling. He was like, ah, I can't find a job. I can't find a job. And then he came to me one day and he said, bro, I found a job. It's really kind of strange, though. I said, tell me about it. He said, man, I opened up the newspaper and the zoo had a job for someone to come in and, you know, help with the gorilla cage. And uh, I was like, I like animals and I'm broke, so it works for me. But he said, bro, when I got there, I went for the interview and the guy said, listen, this is not a job like any other job you've ever heard. Um, all of the gorillas are sick and we've sent them somewhere else to get care. And so what we'd really like someone to do is to wear a gorilla costume to just to entertain the kids that come by <laughs> and pretend you're a gorilla. And he was like, are you serious? I'll do it. So he took the job. He goes in every day, he's dressed up like a gorilla. You know, at first he's a little, a little insecure. He's just doing a little ooh, 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 you know? But then after a little while, the summer goes on, he's having a little bit too much fun and he just starts swinging and jumping and doing all kind of gorilla tricks and eating bananas and the kids are waving and he's like playing all these games. Well, he got a little too into the job, guys. He got a little too into the job. He starts swinging on the little trapeze pieces, right? And he's swinging and he's swinging back and forth and he swang himself off into the lion's part of the zoo. So he lands in there with the lions. He comes to, he recognizes 
oh my gosh, I'm in here with the lions. He freaks out and he's like, oh, oh, help! In full gorilla costume. He's screaming help. So the whole zoo is freaking out like, is that gorilla talking? Like, what's happening right now? He's like, help! And the lion starts coming at him and he's like, help! The lion's gonna kill me, it's gonna kill me! And the lion comes up to him and the lion says, if you don't shut up, we're both gonna lose our jobs, bro. That is absolutely not a true story, but it felt good. It sounded good. No, um, but the moral of that story is this. Everything is not what it appears to be. Everything is not what it appears to be. And, and guys, I want to talk to you guys about um, a lot of things today. You know, we're, we're going to be together for a while. And I'll tell you a little bit about me um, probably later today. But, 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 but let's take a minute just to talk about... Um, you know, how things may seem one way, but they're not. And, and one of, of those things is this, is it seems sometimes that we know God, we understand who God is, we understand what he wants to do in, in this world and in our lives, but, but truthfully, we can fool ourselves. We can fool ourselves into believing that we really do trust God, and we don't. Right, I got three little kids and we do trust falls in my house. I make them like lean on the couch and just fall off the couch into my arms. I always catch them every time, except one time. But we're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but, but things aren't always as we seem. We think we trust, but do we really? And one of my favorite verses in the Bible is a uh, chapter in the Bible, Psalm 23. Anybody familiar with Psalm 23? Psalm 23? Okay. Well, it's, it's the psalm where, you know, David refers to, um, to God as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? It's one of my favorites. And a lot of times people don't realize, see, in the Bible, Psalm 23 is not just, it doesn't stand out there by himself. It's a collection. So it's t Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24. They're like a unit. They go together. And Psalm 22, it talks about Jesus on the cross. And I'm telling you, if you ever read Psalm 22, it gives a more accurate uh, description of what happened to Jesus than a lot of the Gospels do. And it's crazy because Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Jesus was actually born. So it's an amazing prophecy that talks about Jesus being on this cross and stretching himself out. So Psalm 22 talks about Jesus as our suffering sheep. And in the middle, Psalm 23, but then you get to Psalm 24 and it talks about God as our sovereign. He's in control of the whole universe. He's got everything in the palm of his hands. He's this reigning king. Then in the middle is Psalm 23, where we see this God who's in control, this God who, who is, a, he suffered for us, he's a king, but he knows us and he cares for us and he's in control of everything. And so it's one of my favorite, and it, and it, and it refers to, um, you know, David and his relationship with God. I'm going to read it. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Uh, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. One of my favorite verses. In this, you see this God who's taking care of his sheep, right? The shepherd taking care of his sheep. And it's funny that David, you know, David is a shepherd boy, right? So David wrote this song. And, and, and I, when I read it, I thought, oh, he wrote it about sheep because he knows sheep. He was a shepherd boy, so he thinks about sheep. But I think there's another reason he uses sheep. Like, why didn't he use dogs? Why didn't he use cats or pigs? Why do he use sheep? Well, one reason is because he was a shepherd, but the other reason, I believe, is because sheep are the dumbest animals in the world. No, I'm serious. They're the dumbest animals you could ever possibly come across. Sheep are dumb. And I think it's kind of funny that David refers to himself as a sheep. He refers to all of us as sheep. Because when you compare us to God, we're pretty dumb too. All right, I'm going to make the comparison for you. Let me take, first of all, let me explain to you how dumb sheep are. If you took a handful of dog brains, put them all together, you'd get 
uh, I, mean, I mean, sheep brains, I'm sorry, put a, a handful of sheep brains together, you're going to get a mildly smart dog, like a dog that doesn't fetch. If you say fetch, he might run backwards, right? That's the kind of dog you're going to get with sheep brains. Sheep are very uh, dependent, right? So we're in trouble when God calls us sheep. They're super dependent. If you don't take care of them, they'll destroy themselves. So sheep are so dumb. When it's time for them to eat, the grass is right here. They'll eat the grass, eat, 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 till the grass is gone. If you don't move them, they'll just eat dirt. You literally, I'm serious. You got to move, like move over here, buddy. There's some more grass. Like if you don't move them, they'll just eat the dirt. Sheep are not smart. Sheep will lie down on a hillside and go to sleep and then can't get up. Just lying on the side of the hill like, help, help. They have to roll down to the bottom of the hill in order to stand themselves back up. Sheep are not smart creatures, right? They are defenseless. They have no defense. Dogs bite. Cats scratch. Even a skunk has a smell. A sheep has no way to protect itself. It's a defenseless creature. It has weak jaws. The jaws are really, really weak. So even when it's eating grass, it has to like move its mouth from side to side, then pick the grass up out of, out of the ground. Like they're defenseless creatures. They, they, they have weak jaws. They're directionless. They get lost all the time. They're kind of like us. That's us. We just kind of want to do what we want to do, go where we want to go, do what we feel like we should be doing, and they, and they get directionless and they get lost. And what happens when sheep get lost? They get eaten by wolves, right? So sheep are not smart creatures. There's a story of an Australian uh, uh, pastor, right? And this Australian pastor, he was trying to explain to people how dumb sheep were. If anybody's ever been around sheep, you, you've seen this in, in effect. So what he did was he took a stick and all the sheep were coming off of a boat, coming down a ramp, and he put a stick right here at the bottom of the ramp. So the first sheep comes down the ramp, he sees the stick, he says, hey, whoa, let me jump over that. The next sheep comes down off the bottom of the ramp, says, whoa, there's a stick, let me jump over that. The next one jumps over it, then he moves the stick away. Every other sheep coming down the ramp jumped without a stick there. Just follow the leader. They're not smart creatures, so we're kind of in trouble when God calls us sheep. But it's okay, right? Is that my phone ringing? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Hello? Yes. Sorry, it's my wife. She said I have to take this call. Is it, is it cool? I'm joking, guys. It's, it's, a, it's a long. You guys are serious stone-faced in this thing. Like. <laughs> All right, so anyway, we're talking about sheep. So when, when the psalmist writes this, he says, um, he says, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's talking about the, the, this, this relationship that a sheep has with the shepherd. So sheep and shepherds were really tight, right? They're not like, you know, kind of the way we would imagine the relationship with um, 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 sheep and shepherd, you know, from TV or anything like that. They're really tight. The land that these sheep live in is not like pastures that we know. So this land is in between Saudi Arabia and Egypt, right? Israel, the, it's the Middle East. It's, it's not full of green grass for sheep to eat. So for the shepherd to take care of the sheep, it takes a lot of work, right? He's got to work hard um, to, to be able to provide this green place for the sheep to live. And the sheep and the shepherd were really tight, like really, really close. Like if, if they're not like, um, you know, you think about farms and just animals all around. No, 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 no. The sheep and the shepherd had a really tight relationship. So the sheep knew the shepherd's voice. It's kind of like Siri. Right? If I get your phone and I say, hey, Siri, nothing's going to happen. But if, but if I use my phone, my phone says, oh, that's Lecrae. Let me, let me answer. And that's the relationship the sheep and the shepherd had. They were very, very close. Um, verse 2, it, it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I shall not want. And that's just kind of how sheep are. They're not smart enough to get rest on their own, so they need a shepherd to make them lie down. That's what God has to do for us a lot of times is to give us rest. Some of you guys probably stay up till 5 o'clock in the morning playing Fortnite, and you need to go to sleep. It's not smart, right? Look at you judging each other. I see it. You're like, that's not, that's not. Why do we do it? Why do we do that? I don't know why we do it, right? We stay up. Some of you probably stayed up till 7. You had to be at school at 8. What are you doing? It's not smart. A sheep-like behavior. So he's saying we have to trust in God and God alone, right? Um, he goes on to say, he leads me by still water. You know how dumb sheep are? You have, if water's running 
and a sheep tries to drink from it, he'll just get carried away and drown. Literally, if he drinks out of a river, just <laughs> he's out of there. So what the shepherd would have to do, the shepherd would have to take uh, uh, to dig from the running water a trench and dig that trench over to a hole, dig a hole, and all the running water would fill up that hole and the water would be still so the sheep could drink out of that water without fear of drowning. And that's what God has to do for us a lot of times. He's got to, he, 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 he helps us to uh, keep from drowning. He provides us with what we need. He restores our soul. He makes us lie down. He gives us the restoration we need. He's our peace. He's our hope. He says, he restores my soul and leads me in paths of righteousness. So restoration is needed in this place that we know as the Middle East. It's rocky. It's hot. It's a desert. It's not a pretty place. There's mountains and hills. And if you, you go the wrong way, it could cost you your life. So if a sheep wanders the wrong way, he could fall off of a cliff. If a sheep wanders the wrong way in this place, he could suffer from exhaustion and, and, and die uh, from dehydration. If he wanders the wrong way or she wanders the wrong way, they could be eaten by predators. So it's very important that the shepherd lead them. And God is our good shepherd, and he tells us this, there's a way that seems right to us, but in the end is death. God tells us there's a way that we should follow, and that's his way, that our way seems right, but it's not the right way. There's a way. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So God is giving us, uh, comparing us to sheep and saying, hey, don't be like sheep and wander whatever way you want to go. Follow me. I'm the way that you should go. And this is my favorite part, guys. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. So, anybody know anything about geography? This is what a valley is. A valley sits in the middle of two mountains or two cliffs. Let's say there's a cliff right here, valley, cliff right here. And what David is saying is, we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. So you look up on this side, tall cliff. Look up on this side, tall cliff. We're walking through the valley. Guess what's hanging out on top of those cliffs? Predators, mountain lions, wolves, creatures. Sitting there watching the sheep licking their lips like, mm -mm -mm, I'm getting that one right there. Come on down, come on down. So they're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but they're not afraid. Why are they not afraid? Because the shepherd is with them, and he's got his rod, and he's got his staff. Now, if these sheep are just walking through by themselves, there's no hope. They're done. They're cooked. They're dinner. Because they've got to go straight, and all the momentum from the top of a valley coming down is on the side of the predator. Just shoo, snatch them up. There's nowhere to go. You can run straight, but you can't, get, you can't get far. You can't run up faster than he can run down. So you're dinner, unless the shepherd is there. And the shepherd has the rod and the staff, and he starts, hey, back up. Watch out. Right? Side note, we know that David was a shepherd boy. So it's no wonder he was able to defeat Goliath because he knew how to use that sling. Instead, he'd already taken out some predators before using his sling. So Goliath was easy. I was like, oh, yeah, I've done this plenty of times with lions and bears. Goliath, you're nothing. So I say, I say that to say this. Here's a little message for you. Whatever God puts in your hand, whatever tool you have, use it and use it well and learn how to use it. Because you never know when God is going to stand you in front of a Goliath where you're going to have to use that tool that he's given you. It may seem small and significant, just a slingshot just knowing how to rap, but God can use it in amazing ways. Um, but back to this, he goes, you know, and, and, and shows us that he's not afraid. And that's what God wants us to understand is that he's here to comfort us, that we do walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Like we are in circumstances and situations where we don't know how we'll ever get through it. But God is our shepherd. He's got his rod. He's got his staff to protect us and to guide us. I also think that staff is good for spankings. You got to spank those sheep sometimes, right? Hey, what you doing? Look, get over here. You're going the wrong way. Like if the sheep gets to wandering around too much, you got to, hey, 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 hey. And the sheep's not mad at that. Well, God also disciplines those who he loves. Sometimes we need God to just, hey, hey, get back on track. Sometimes stuff happens. 
You know what I mean? Things happen in our lives where we're like, what's going on? It's God saying, you just get back on track is what's going on. And so that's a comfort because it helps us to keep from getting eaten uh, by predators. And so from us, for us, we just, these are reminders for us that God is our guide, that he fights our battles, that he wins our victories. Um, and then it says, lastly, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Oh, he also, I'll take it back. He anoints my head with oil and prepares a plate for me in front of my enemies. And that just goes to say, these predators are sitting there watching as the sheep get fed. Right? God is, the shepherd is feeding the sheep just like God is feeding us in front of the enemies. And he anoints their head with oil. He's saying, I'm anointing you, I'm blessing you, I'm feeding you, I'm providing for you in the middle of your enemies. Interesting thing about sheep. Sheep are not clean animals. I don't know if you guys have ever been around. They're, they're not fluffy and white. You don't want to snuggle up with them. They're pretty nasty. They get dirty, filthy, nasty, and they get this disease, right? Like this, I don't know what kind. It's like a sheep disease. It's like the sheep flu or something like that, right? And their nose gets full of like pus and maggots. It's pretty nasty. And what the sheep like to do they like to rub noses with each other and spread the sheep flu. And so what the shepherd would do is he would take this oil, this salve, and he would cover their heads with it, and it would heal the sickness, get rid of the maggots. So now when they start rubbing noses together, guess what they're sharing? They're sharing the cure and not the disease. And that's what God wants us to be like. God wants us to consistently share the cure, share the hope of Jesus with one another and not the disease of sin and death and destruction. He wants us to share the hope and the love that God has provided uh, in us with one another. And so he says, he anoints my head with oil. Um, and, and, and that's how he blesses. And he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And y'all, that's the beauty of a relationship with God. God is not just the good shepherd. He's not just the chief shepherd. God is my shepherd. He wants to be your shepherd. And you have to ask yourself that question from time to time. Is God my shepherd? Because we're, we're prone to wander. We like to wander. We like to go our own way. And guess what? God doesn't want you to wander. Right? God wants to embrace you and love you and take care of you in the same way the shepherd wants to take care of the sheep. Um, God, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to Jesus. Lord, we're all going to stand before him one day. And what's that going to be like? Right? If you've got a right relationship with him, it's going to be wonderful. But if you don't really know if you know him, it's scary. I remember when I was a kid, my mom, I, mom, I stayed home by myself. And when I stayed home by myself, my mom would, you know, give me this list of chores to do before she got home. And so it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You know, 4 o'clock comes around. Yeah, I'm going to do it. She's going to get home till 6, 4.45. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. 4.55, it's 5 o'clock. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. 5.35, yeah, I'm going to get to it as soon as my show goes off. Around 6 o'clock, I hear the garage door. Guess what I'm doing? <laughs> Clean, mop, scrub. I'm doing everything as quick as I possibly can. I'm in fear. I'm in fear because... I'm not where I need to be, right? But if I had it all done, if everything was taken care of, when I hear the garage door come up, I'm not in fear. I'm excited to see mom because everything is done and our relationship is good. And, and, and y'all, God's not asking us to clean up ourselves. God's just saying, trust me and let me be your shepherd because when you see me, you don't have to fear. You'll have nothing to fear. You're nothing but a good relationship. We're dumb. We're sheep, right? We're pitiful. My youngest son, Landon, when he was born, he was pitiful. No, he was. He couldn't feed himself, use the bathroom on himself all the time. You know what I mean? He's just pitiful. I was like, man, you don't do anything for us. You just can't take care of yourself. But you know what? Even though his performance was pitiful, his position was perfect because he was my son, and I was going to take care of him, and I was going to make sure he was fed. I was going to make sure he was changed. I was going to do all that for him. So we, that's who we are with God. Our performance is pitiful. We can never do enough for God to be like, you know what, good job. 
but we can trust him. And that puts us in a great position to be God's children. Right? God wants to be our shepherd. He wants to take care of us. He wants us to not fear the valley of the shadow of death. Right? There's a, there's a story, I tell the story often of a, a young girl. She's afraid of a bee. Right? A bee's flying around. She's five years old. She's freaking out. She's like, Daddy! The bee's going to get me! She's screaming. She's losing her mind. And her father walks over. Her father sees the bee, reaches out <laughs> like a ninja, grabs it. He holds on to the bee. He says, ah! He lets it go. The bee flies around. She says, Daddy, no! He says, no, sweetheart. Daddy took the sting out of the bee. Can't hurt you now. Guess what, y'all? Jesus has taken the sting out of death. Death can't hurt those of us who trust in him and his word. We can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil because God is with us. He's the good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd but is he your shepherd? Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, because you're good. You're so good, you want to take care of us, you want to provide for us, you want to allow us all these amazing opportunities to be who you've called us to be. And we're grateful for that. Uh, we thank you that you love us, that you give us uh, pasture and uh, provision and righteousness, and you restore our souls. And I pray for anybody in here who wonders, do I know the good shepherd? Um, that God, you would just reach out and embrace them. Allow them to trust that Jesus has already taken death on himself. He died the death we should have died. He lived the life we should have lived. But because he resurrected, we can have hope. And so we thank you for that. Uh, we honor you. In Jesus' name.